Thank you for downloading Tucker Center Talks. This is season three, episode 15. You're listening to Tucker Center Talks, a podcast from the Tucker Center for Research on Girls and Women in Sport at the University of Minnesota and a co-production with WISP Sports. I'm your host for Tucker Center Talks, Dr. Nicole Lavoie, director of the Tucker Center. Tucker Center Talks is a place where I get to talk to, amplify, and support my female colleagues, amazing women who study sport and gender from multidisciplinary perspectives. We let data tell the story and we talk about our research and happenings in the world in ways that disrupt and change the world of sport to be a better place. In this podcast, I'm talking to my colleagues and fellow disruptors, which we have not done a segment in quite a long time. And there's so many disruptions in the landscape. We have a lot to talk about. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Nancy Lowe, Dr. Ann Pegarero, Dr. Katie LaBelle. Welcome back to Disruptors. Good to be back. All right. Let's, what a time. <laughs> yeah, what a time to be a disruptor in women's sport. There's um, so much to talk about. So top of mind right now, it's November 22nd, 2021. The NWSL just finished their season. And we have finally heard from the Chinese tennis player who had gone missing and has now resurfaced. And um, I think let's talk about how maybe these two things are both related to disruptions within the system of women's sport. So who, who wants to start us off? And if you want to bring in other disruptions, that's t- good, too, because there's so many to talk about. Well, I'll just I'll start us off with, and I'm looking at a, a pronunciation for Peng Shui as it is is hyphenetically or phonetically spelled, I guess, um, about the particular situation that's been surrounding this Chinese athlete, which for those who may not know what happened, um, in essence, she accused a high-level Chinese Communist Party official of sexual assault. And she did those allegations on a social media platform, somewhat twi- similar to Twitter, but they don't have Twitter in China. Within 30 minutes, that post had come down, but many athletes had seen it uh, across the world, including U.S. athletes. And I believe it was Naomi Osaka who was the first to follow up with a post asking, Where is Peng Shui? Um, so Considerable concern was expressed uh, for days on end as no one knew exactly where she was and really wondered if she, in fact, was safe. Um, And in response to that, perhaps in my mind, what has been really interesting is the WTA commissioner's response. He clearly was unwilling to accept any of the, the media coming out of China that was clearly created to demonstrate that um, there was nothing at at odds with Peng Shui, that she was okay, that she was well. And of course, they were completely ignoring the allegations. But in the face of that, the commissioner of the WTA, he has continued to say that they will not play in China, um, threatening, making very, very strong threats against an incredibly powerful government something of the likes we've really not seen in sport. So I, I think that is to me, maybe the setup for, mm-hmm. for what the situation um, involves. Well, and I think two big things and I'll um, let Ann and Katie weigh in is one, where's the IOC, right? And two, given that Beijing is ho- hosting the winter Olympics in literally weeks, what does this mean for this athlete for social justice, for human rights, leading into a very visible sporting event. So Ann and Katie, what do you make of this? Yeah. Can I, can I just update first? They, the uh, IOC, IOC, not the USOC, obviously, because this is China did have a 30 minute video call with her over the weekend. Um, That's new news. But even in the wake of that, the commissioner of the WTA is still saying he's not convinced um, that she is free and that she is safe and so forth. So 
Right. We'll let others take it from there. Well, from the perspective of the news that we're seeing in Canada, it's renewing a call for a boycott of the games. And so there's these levels of boycotts, right? We saw last week our Justin Trudeau was hanging out with your Biden and they were they were discussing and they were talking about a diplomatic boycott, meaning no diplomats would go right to, to give that level. What I've seen in the last couple of days, and I don't know if Katie, we've seen the scene, it's, it seems to now be back to a full discussion of a boycott. Um, and, you know, that's a that's that's something that needs to be. I think really discussed because it's, it's twofold. It hurts the athletes. And I agree that that's a real problem, but the problem is this system that the IOC is awarding games to countries with such egregious human rights problems. And so if we're going to think about all these things we propose about sport being sport for good and all the things it can do, we've got to stop rewarding people who have atrocious human rights records with major mega events like this. Right. Which was the problem when they had the Summer Olympics, I believe, in 2008. There was a lot of disruption and calls for holding China responsible for human rights violations and nothing happened. And here we are, you know, how many years later and we're having the same discussion. Yeah. And I think. And one of the big, you know, coming off the heels of the Summer Olympic Games, too, right? The sustainability of the broader Olympic movement. Um, this does not help that. And was Thomas Bach really the best person um, for to to let us know that she was safe? And and what are the politics around that? And how like what's the transparency there? It just seems like it's. Um, a, I think of it from a PR standpoint. I don't know if I, if I agree uh, how how wise that is, but I think to Anne's point, it it seems to have kind of backfired uh, around the, the the broader Olympic move, movement, right? Like um, if we're trying to encourage safe sport and in, encourage the next generation of sport participation, are these the headlines that we really want to be taking center stage? Uh, I think that's one of the big problems that I see. Um, every Olympic cycle uh, seems to be shrouded in in controversy and scandal. This is not going to help that. And as women sports scholars, too, right, we need to be getting to the bottom of this. We need to making sure that these athletes are safe and listening to them when they have uh, stories like this to share um, and, and, and cleaning it up, not trying to throw it under the rug. And what's interesting about this instance with the WTA, which is the Women's Tennis Association, pushing for change and trying to hold China and the IOC accountable, they're the ones pushing. And then we go to the NWSL where there was allegations of sexual abuse that were wide known and widespread and covered up. Again, we've got the voices of women. You know, then you go back to the USA Gymnastics and then you, you there's just layer upon layer. Like how many times do we have to have the same conversation within a different sporting context where women's voices and experiences and bodies have been disregarded and, uh, and when is it going to stop? Yeah. And I mean, if you well, saw with the NWSL one, so, so one of the, the players that did an article in, in Canada comes from my hometown. Um, I watched her grow up, Jenna Hellstrom, and she was with the Washington spirit and she spoke out about her experiences, why she left after one year. What I, I wonder about is the reporting of this. Cause then the rest of it, the, of course, the, the, the two sided is reach out to the coach and get a comment. And they allowed him to essentially gaslight her. She's a cancer for the team. She ruined the, the dressing room. She, she, but, you know, fought my my brilliance at every every corner. And I was like, so now it's like the, the, the premise of believing the women is is the beginning of the article. But then you let the abuser back in with that kind of a power. And so part of me says the media could also I get fair reporting. But how does he get to text message back and create these like completely false narratives around this athlete when we know there's so many other athletes on the teams that have come out and said the same thing? Yeah, and I think if you circle back, I, I mean, what we've seen in the last couple of years, at least, well, I mean, history has taught us that money talks. Uh, and in the case of the WTA stand, what's so interesting about that is I think they have nine tournaments in in China um, scheduled annually. That's and, and you think about the sponsorship dollars that are associated with that. That's hundreds of millions of dollars. That's 
speaks volumes. That's a big stand. Uh, and, and that seems like that part of it is what um, gets listened to. And so maybe that, again, maybe it's the money talks approach that seems to be getting the attention, not necessarily the athletes, um, mm. where it maybe is better directed. But it does seem that that's how change is starting to get. I think that's why it stole headlines all weekend, uh, because the WA took a stand with hundreds of millions of dollars behind that stand. Actually, Katie, it's closer to a billion. So, really? and, and this, yeah, and and I would agree with you. But I, I, this is where I think it's this stance of Steve Simon is so interesting, right? So, we need male allies. We've said that all along. Um, and to Anne's point about you know disparaging the female athlete from the person who was accused of of abusing her, that's the the type of pattern that we've seen in the past, right? And no question, traditional media remains problematic with regard to how they handle these issues. But that's exactly why I think it's so interesting that Steve Simon is, is drawing this hard line in the sand because no one in any sport has done this before. So yeah, it's, it's 11 tournaments that were supposed to happen in 2022 in China. They're building a facility in China their investment in the WTA was significant, totaling up to, like they said, a billion dollars. Um, so for the WTA commissioner to still continue, he's even said with this 30 minute video you know, interview that the IOC did, that he's not convinced. And I, I, we all know why, right? The censorship that China, that China uh, imposes on their athletes, we'll just leave it there. Um, is is something that is problematic. And until, you know, he's saying until he is able to meet with her directly, he's not going to be convinced. And that is a really, really hard line. But it's a hard line from a leader, right, of a women's sport who is taking it in a new direction. I think that's what we like to talk about here with disruptors, right? This is a disruption because he's not just taking what they're giving him and saying, okay, well, we need to play nice because it's a whole lot of money and we need that money. Instead, he's saying, we're going to hold on strong and do what's right for the athlete at the center of this um, because that's what this this or, this sport organization is all about. So I, I think that is a huge disruption mm -hmm. and something to be applauded in my mind. And kind of opposite what the NBA did, right? When they sort of came afoul of some stuff with China and really sort of backed down. And I mean, I saw a lot of renewed calls for, for LeBron James today to you know, this week to step up. And, and, and so this whole, like you look at the WTA that I guess maybe they're not as tied to the commercial products like Nike is, and they can, they can take this stance, but it seems almost everybody looking at the market of China is afraid, right? They're afraid to lose that massive consumer market. And so they're not calling them uh, on task for what they're doing, but the WTA is taking a real different approach. Yeah, and well, to put it into context, it was a $400 million tweet, basically, is what it was. So it was an NBA exec who said he stood in support with Hong Kong, um, which China took direct offense to. And it wasn't even an NBA athlete, right? We can imagine what the fallout would have been if it had been an NBA athlete. But you're right, the NBA as a league couldn't backpedal fast enough, apologize fast enough. Um, and it cost them about $400 million. But think about that. The WTA is no NBA Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are doing their best to be a, a very significant sport property. But um, I think that even shows you in the juxtaposition of the power and the privilege um, of the two leagues. And yet Steve Simon is still drawing this hard line in the sand. Kind of interesting. It comes back to women leading in sport, though, too. Right. Which is maybe the broader disruption that we're talking about here. And we're seeing it time and time again. Um, it's the end of the year and I've already started to see some of the, the polls. There was a book that came out recently that was talking about disruptions in sport where women weren't mentioned at all, uh, or sorry, social justice leadership in sport where there was no attention paid to, to women athletes. But there's this consistent pattern where this has become part of the brand of women's sport. They are, they are standing up for what's right. They're standing up for social justice. And I, I think that that's probably a winning a winning take, right? Um, but they are owning that, and they're they're not backing down. They're 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 you know bending towards justice, um, and I think that that's something to really be applauded. And and what a what a nice part of your brand to have, right? Brand asset. Yeah. So I think these these two disruptions, uh, in context of the many disruptions in the sport landscape right now, again point to. Perhaps 
that women's sport and leaders of women's sport are moving the needle and pushing for greater good for sport and perhaps outside of sport. So let's wrap up this disruption, this segment of disruptors. Uh, Any final comments? I mean, I think, you know, we're seeing it over and over again, just like Katie said. So women are leading with the values. This is, uh, to me, the WTA stance is, is a big move. It's a big disruptors move um, and has the chance to move it. We've seen the athletes. We've seen leagues that are more North American take this stance, but now we've seen an international association take it. And I feel like this is a laddering up and it could be um, definitely one of the biggest disruptors that we've seen to really create the, the value-based social justice sport that women's women's sport leads in. Great. Go women. Go go (laughs) women. Yes. So let's pay attention to these disruptors moving forward and we'll continue to talk about this. So let's wrap this. This is the end of our disruption discussion of sport for today. Tune in again for the disruptor segment of Tugger Center Talks. We'd also like to invite you to join us in drawing attention to disruptions in sport that disrupt the male dominated model or that benefit women's sport or female athletes by using the disruptors hashtag in your social media. You can find the show notes with links and resources for this episode at wisports.com. Look for Tucker Center Talks under the Listen tab, where you'll find a lot more conversations from the world of women's sport. Thank you for listening and helping us turn up the volume on women's sport. That's a wrap for Tucker Center Talks. I'm your host, Dr. Nicole Lavoie. Give yourself grace, support others, and let the data tell the story. I'm signing off to make a difference in the lives of girls and women in sport until the next time. Mm